Tonight on Joy News Prime, flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress, John Mahama, has served notice that the party will not accept the results of the 2020 general elections should it deem the process as unfair. Let nobody assume that we will accept the results of a flawed election. The minority in Parliament says Ghana has become a police state in which free speech is being clamped down on by the executive. We think that the manner of arrest of the said apostle leaves much to be desired. Look, the arrest in, 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 in every respect was unlawful. All of a sudden, we have all been cowed to submission. But Chairman of Parliament's Defence and Interior Committee, Sete Champon, disagrees. And in business? Food prices drive inflation rates for May to 11.3%. In terms of contribution to year-on-year -year inflation, we see food as the major contributor, and food is contributing about 56 percentage point. Also in this bulletin, farmer with visual impairment wished for a decent housing accommodation, and it appears that dream may just come true. Ago. Amen. Yo. Yo. My name is Aisha Ibrahim, anchoring joining is Prime Live from our studios in Kokom Limla on digital address GA 0992539. We're also free to air because we are on DTT. The bulletin is also live on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. <laughs> Many thanks for choosing us. The flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress, John Mahama, has served notice that the party will not accept the results of the 2020 general elections should they deem the process as unfair. Speaking at a flag raising ceremony to commemorate the NDC's 28th anniversary, Mr. Mahama said the party has participated in all elections in the Fourth Republic and accepted defeat each time they lost. But stressing on the disagreements between the NDC and the Electoral Commission on the voters register he warned the party may not accept the results of the upcoming elections my brothers and sisters this year we have the eighth election since the advent of our fourth republic never have we in the history of this fourth republic experienced such a strange situation where six months to an election we are all unsure what register we are going to use for the vote. It has never happened in the Fourth Republic. Never have we in the history of the Fourth Republic since our population threatened to be disenfranchised by the bungling inefficiency and perceived partiality of our once revered electoral. We all await the hearing in court tomorrow to determine that we have a flawed or we have an election that we have confidence in, that the will of the people has been properly expressed. As a party, we have participated in every election in the Fourth Republic, and we have of accepting results of elections whenever we have believed in the integrity of As leader of the NDC, I wish to serve notice that we shall do all our part to ensure that our country remains peaceful and that the electoral process proceeds smoothly. But, and a big but, let nobody assume that we will accept the results of a flawed election. The NDC flag bearer also thrown, has also thrown a challenge to anyone who doubts the NDC's achievements to confront the project documented on the party's famous Green Book. The are well documented in the Green Book and I urge all doubters to get a copy 
and step into their communities and cross-check if the projects outlined there, the e-blocks, the interchanges, the hospitals, and other transformational projects exist only in that book. Now joining me via Zoom is an associate professor of political science at the University of Ghana, Professor Ransford Jampo. Good evening to you. Many thanks for your time on Joy News Prime. Prof Jampo, you're on Joy News Prime. Prof, if you can unmute your um, audio, then we can, you can hear me. Hello, Hi. Professor Jampo. So we will not accept any flawed elections. These are the words of the former president, John Mahama. Now, from a political communication perspective, what do you make of the former president's comment? Uh, please, I don't, I'm not a political communicationist. I teach political science. Uh, um, if you want to have my take on that, I think what I want to say is that um, being peace-loving and being democratic, um, in my view, is not licentious for the acceptance of results of elections that can reasonably be described as flawed. Indeed, flawed elections in every democracy all over the world um, are not acceptable. And so what John Mahama has said, in my view, um, is nothing that must warrant protracted debate or comment or discussion. You would agree with me, you recall that in 2013, the election petition at the Supreme Court, Ghana's apex court of the land, exposed monumental flaws in our electoral processes that could not be glossed over by any well-meaning or discerning person. And in it, uh, that was the reason why um, the 2012 election, the results, was not accepted. And um, it were ushered into an eight-month period of election election petition. I, I believe you recall. Definitely so. Uh, there are conditions that must exist before, during, and after every elections to make the results acceptable. And generally, these conditions require that the processes must be reasonably flawless of course we are developing democracy we are transitional democracy and so there may be hitches with the processes here and there but the hitches should not assume that monumental level in a way that would undermine popular acceptance of the results and so once the flaw once there are no flaws or once the flaws are minimal then the results the acceptance of the results would be Will be, will be easy. Otherwise, um, it is within the rights of any political party or political party leader to say that I'm not accepting um, the results of any flawed election. But it is, Trump, uh, some this have said this comment be, is premature and adds to the seeming tension already brewing, especially when there are still legal avenues that could be explored. Do you agree? No, we've not gotten there. Please note this. Um, the man is saying that if the results are flawed, we will not accept it. And I'm saying that flawed electoral results are unacceptable all over the world. And so um, it is not a big deal for, for any democracy, for any um, contender in an election to say that if the results are flawed, um, I wouldn't accept it. Um, the leader of the opposition party is saying this. And I'm thinking the leader of the ruling party must also be saying the same. If the results are unacceptable, uh, if the results are flawed, they are unacceptable. They should be unacceptable to both parties or, or to all major contenders in the election. What one decides to do if he refuses to accept the election results? What one decides to do if he refuses to accept the monumentally flawed election results is what we must be thinking about. Is the person going to court? If the person wants to go to court, so be it. This wouldn't be the first time. Is the person going to hit the streets to cause mayhem to make the country ungovernable? These are the things we will have to be um, interrogating. But for me, anybody who says that I will not accept the results of a monumentally flawed election is still within um, um, his rights, and he doesn't do any harm to any um, um, to our democracy. Democracies all 
over the world are intolerant of monumentally flawed election results. Prof, you've and been so following the say, debate, Prof, you've been following the debate on the voter register exercise. Do you think the processes adopted by the EC will indeed compromise the December 7 polls, as the NDC has always said? Well, I, I think there's been um, um, still mix, um, the, the oh, for some time now, what I'm seeing is that the EC is overly accepting its independence. The opposition party has also um, is also sticking to its intrans intransigent position. I mean, conditions before or conditions leading to the conduct of every elections are serious in determining whether the elections are going to be peaceful, um, transparent, free, and fair. And so, my advice is that um, the election management body. Yes, it is cloaked with the independence to do whatever it has to do. But if it is faced with a major, you know, opposition or there are, there are disagreements as to the way and manner it must go on or go about its activities, what it can do is to be able to tone down on the assertion of its independence to see whether there can be some form of consensus building. And then the opposition party must also tone down on its intransigent position. And then the ruling party must also desist from serving as the mouthpiece of the Electoral Commission because it's, it's a contestation. So long as you go speak for the Electoral Commission and you defend the Electoral Commission even better than the Electoral Commission itself, it creates suspicion in the minds of the opposition that, well, maybe the ruling party is even running affairs of the Electoral Commission. And so, number one, the Electoral Commission must try as much as possible to build consensus and to tone down on the assertion of its independence. You see, um, building consensus is not, it's not, it's not, um, it's not an easy, easy job. It requires somebody who understands the rudiments of the process. It's not just about calling meeting and then telling people what you want to do and what you don't want to do. I'm they grateful must tone for your time, Professor of, of their Ransford. Professor Ransford Jampo is an associate professor of political science at the University of Ghana. Now, the Coalition of Domestic Election Observers say the Electoral Commission must engage the various political parties and consider accepting the existing voter ID card in compilation of a new voter register. The constitutional instrument backing the EC's plan to compile the register matured yesterday. Eligible voters have to use the Ghana card or their passport to register for the new card. A move that has sparked controversy. But in a statement issued by the election observer, failing to accept the existing voter ID may burden grantors as many eligible voters do not possess the Ghana card and the passports, said the statement. The AC has maintained that existing register is bloated and not fit for purpose. National coordinator of Kodeo, Albert Kofi Ahin, spoke on the polls earlier today. Originators of this idea, you know, you know, had in mind that, if, for example, my mother has lost the card or doesn't have it, I can lead my mother or my sister to the police center and vouch for her. That is the original idea. Mm. But this has been defeated, you know, because uh, from past experience, you find everybody from anywhere guaranteeing for other people. You know, so Kodeo is saying that this system once again could be abused. And more so by the fact that now you can even guarantee for about 10 people. You see, so what we are saying is that, yes, people don't have the NIA cards, they don't have the passports, so we need to be very careful so that we can have a lot of people participating in the process. Mm -hmm. If you go to the villages, how many people have passports in the village? It's only when you have the intention to travel that you might want to possess a passport. As regards the NIA card, as I'm speaking to you now, I don't have one. And nobody in my household has one because we tried and tried and tried and we couldn't get it. You see, so I can foresee or could you see that in other areas it could be the same. And it's so sad that, you know, the you know, parliament has passed the TI-126 
otherwise, you know, this thing should be looked at. Even now, we are still urgent, but there should be a second look taken at this particular problem. You see, because we are saying that if we are not careful as a nation, we might have problems at the various education centers. Now, this is not the right time to compile a new voters register. That's according to Domahine Osage for Siadio Ajiman Bedu II. He says the prevailing conditions surrounding the compilation of a new register, including COVID-19 six months to elections and the requirements for the registration, makes the impending exercise unwise. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, again, and yeah, and your paper, nobody check passport, and your NHA card, nobody check. Oh, him, I just mentioned easy. I can make catch up and say, Samre, Osha, and Mraka, and yet, yes, a bit me a register. Ama, and she said, What about one of them? Yet, my diso, I got so on the BBB, I mean, him there, and the uncle, it's a Ghana for. Now, I do when you match them, sir. The most sensible thing, as I say, and as I'm ready, and I said, Yeah, but you need a coro. Yeah, that's right. You are a boy, I said, or more coro than threat. And still on your election headquarters, the politics of curses, that's what appears to be creeping into the narrative in the lead up to an election set to be a cliffhanger. The very recent incident involved some NPP supporters who invoked curses on the national executives for disqualifying some candidates in the upcoming primaries. Jojo Kovina throws the spotlight on this phenomenon. Heavy is the head that leads the Electoral Commission. Aside from many verbal assaults held at them, sometimes they have to endure curses. I'm not referring to English curses or swear words, but traditional eggs breaking, schnapps pouring, vituperative ill wishes, all cooked and wrapped in dangerous cocktails. <laughs> This happened in 2016. Traditional priestess besieged the MPP Bantama office and raid cases on the then EC boss Charlotte Say. Former President Mahama and his family also endured some cases. Then, 11 months ago, a group claiming to be NDC supporters also invoked cases on Electoral Commissioner Jin Mensam and her deputies. Electoral Commission, a free young army, the men have so, everything the commissioners so. The best was my son and any penny for the best as a moment prepared for you and your human. Nananum, yes, sir, and anonymous was him, sir. Obi and penny for my kids will be an agent, sir. When you are my group, will be because baby. No, I yeah, I attend here. I'm a man of seven, I yeah, you try here to say, I'm back to a sermon. I try for a farmer, man, you'll be an anonymous sermon. As the NPP parliamentary primaries heat up, many delegates are happy with the party's National Executive Committee decision to allow some candidates to go unopposed, vented by invoking cases. If we constituency, yo, regional, yo, national, yo, on the post, we say my elbow bobano, yo, or be be our new movie, be anana, yo, and musano. This development caught the attention of the MPP national leadership and the threatened suspension of people 
who invoked curses. The conduct of some members claiming to be invoking curses on the party leadership, and in particular on members of the National Executive Committee, on allegations that their preferred candidate have been disqualified by neck from contesting the primaries. We are completely appalled by such gross misconduct. Accordingly, the party is instructing the respective constituencies or constituency executives in the constituencies where these unfortunate incidents happen, happen to immediately suspend all those involved in this awkward behavior whilst instituting appropriate disciplinary actions against them in line with Article 3 and 4 of the party's constitution. But why would people resort to cases instead of dialoguing? We caught up with one MPP member of Cabrillo West, Silas Bar. Some of the youth believed that it was the way to go. And I think that in moments like this, emotions do flare up. And I, I think that it is one of those, those um, moments when there was an overflow of emotions. That's how come they resorted to the burning of ties and the rest. Some believe more people are now resorting to traditional invocation of cases because of frustration with the political system. If they are not doing the right thing, we will still curse them. That's my opinion on one. We will still curse them because we vote them to go. To, to, to do our, our need. We don't vote them to go and sit down and sit down in the lodging cars and be happy of no, no. And you come to our area and tell us that, oh, if I vote for you, you vote for me, I will do this, I will do this, and we'll face the same one. If they don't change their attitude, we'll stick at them. And in police, every, this one says this, that one says that, but still people are not really getting results. People are, people are still wallowing in poverty. That's why they are resorting to all these cases, you know. Maybe to instill some fear in them. You could, that's why they are coming out like this. People are fed up. As the 2020 election campaign heats up, we are likely to see more unusual happenings in the political scene and the invocation of cases may just be at a time mistrust and disillusionment may be hitting the roof. Jojo Kovner, Joy News. The minority in Parliament says Ghana has become a police state in which free speech is being clamped down on by the executive, citing yesterday's arrest of Apostle Kwabna Oswege as one example. Addressing a media briefing in Parliament House, ranking member on Parliament's Defence and Interior Committee, James Agalga, condemned the arrest, describing it as unlawful and unconstitutional. We saw on social media horrific videos of Apostle um, Kwabna Ajay. He is alleged to have made certain inflammatory um, statements against President Akufado and the person of the chairperson of the EC, Jean Mensa. We don't support all manner of inflammatory statements that have the potential to undermine our peace and security. We think that the manner of arrest of the said apostle leaves much to be desired. Look, the arrest in, 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 in every respect was unlawful. All of a sudden, we have all been cowed to submission. But we're saying that our spirit, the spirits of Ghanaians, cannot be broken. And we shall continue to hold the president to the fire of accountability. He must be account held accountable to the people of this country. Sovereignty resides in the people, not President Akufado. Mr. Galga added the recent police summoning of Bernard Mona, Major Retired Yabwa Tingjan, and journalist Kofi Aduma are examples of human rights violations being sponsored by the state, which Ghanaians should resist. He says government is engaged in a deliberate act to silence people who have been speaking out against it to cow the populace into submission. We also want to state without any equivocation that in recent times a number of invitations have been extended to certain political actors in our country. It started with Major Boatijan. All Major Boatijan said was that the conduct of the EC could spell doom for this country and that that could ignite a civil strife in our country. 
based upon his analysis of the existing political tensions in our country. They immediately arrested Major Boachijan, cautioned him, extracted statements from him. Next was Bernard Mona, the PNC chairman. He made very similar statements. Bernard Mona admonished the EC that the path they were taking us had the potential to degenerate into violence, and that if care was not taken, violence would erupt at the various polling stations across the country if the EC decides to compile a new voters register. The analysis Honorable Bernard Mona made immediately landed him in the grips of the police. There appears to be some amount of selectivity when it comes to dealing with matters of this nature. Mr. Gaga says President Tekufado's reputation as a human rights activist is being dented by such arrests. He's calling for the establishment of a committee of inquiry to investigate what he says are the several unlawful arrests by the security agencies. We want to sound a word of caution to President Tekufado that his credentials as a human rights advocate have diminished. It's nothing to write home about. And that his reputation is on the line. I am very certain that the reasons why officers who are supposed to be professional in, in carrying out their duties, even when it comes to effecting arrests, can no longer be carried out in a competent and professional manner is because of the recruitment of hoodlums and party vigilantes, faithfuls into our security agencies. Minority spokesperson on communications, ABA Fuseni, urged the security agencies to arrest NPP General Secretary John Buedu and Deputy General Secretary Obri Bwahin, as well as Owusu Bempa, for making similar comments. Mr. John Buedu, General Secretary of the New Petroti Party, said that they will fiercely resist attempts by the NIA to do a mop-up exercise. Yes. You are colleagues of the media, if I'm lying, tell me. The president's spiritual guru, <laughs> Reverend, so-called Reverend uh, Osu Bempa, made death threats, death threats, and even went on to say he knows those who are in, uh, planning to go and kill. Okay? And actually followed out his threat with an invasion, a Gestapo raid type of raid at the XYZ radio uh, uh, stations. <coughs> in which they threatened to beat and kill the likes of Mugabe Masi and other colleague journalists. Because the man is the spiritual guru of the president, nothing has happened to him. Okay? So this is the lopsided application of the law, application of the law that is happening under the watch of Nana Kufadu. But Parliament's Defence and Interior Committee uh, Chairman Seth A. Champon disagrees. He says the security agencies are only doing their job. National security did not just get up to go and arrest the gentleman, the apostle, as we presently know him. The national security secured an arrest warrant and a search warrant from the courts of the Republic of Ghana, equally a creation of the Constitution. And by that authority, they arrested a gentle person. It is out there in the news that the security services are being challenged and accused, allegedly, that they planted substance on the suspect. The substance, from my information, was found with the suspected substance and it was not planted by any person. I'm sure in due course, the mandated state institution will come out and give better and further particulars to this particular matter, and it will put it to rest. So I want to state that no state institution did such. Post securing of the arrest and search warrant, the suspect was further searched and it will interest all everybody listening to me now. He was arrested in the presence of my own good friend, Honorable Ajumandia, former DCE, District Chief Executive of Kwabibrim. And Ajumandia Ajingo, as I call him, as I know him, is a good brother 
who is a competitor and a fellow NDC person, a Ghanaian like myself. And so I would beg my colleagues in the minority to be clear on the facts. The modus operandi, we all understand. The standard operating procedures of the security services varies. And I wouldn't want to stand here and say that I am a better person and a place judge to decide how they go about their duties. Federance to that. Kwame Bafo, popularly known as Abronye, subjected himself through the process. The Criminal Investigations Department of our Police Service took statements of him and went through the ritual, and he was allowed a bail. We're still live on Joy News Prime. Remember, Joy News is free to air because we are on digital terrestrial TV. And still to come in this bulletin, a farmer with visual impairment wished for a decent housing accommodation. And it appears that dream may just come true. Oh, amen. There is more when we return from this break. And it's time for business. Sandra Fene is here with the very latest. Hi, Sandra. Yes, we are going to talk about inflation. Food prices driving the inflation rate. It keeps going yeah. high anytime you go to the market, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You like food, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Take it All right, time, celebrating right. 25 years of joy. My name is Sandra S. And I'm here for business. We'll be doing that inflation story. But first, the National Insurance Commission, the NIC, is being urged to extend the deadline for insurance companies to meet the minimum capital requirements. According to insurance marketer Edgar Ruedu. This has become necessary as a result of the outbreak of the infamous COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Ruedu believes the emergence of the disease has crippled a lot of businesses for which the insurance industry is no exception. Bismarck Awusa's report. In 2019, regulator of the insurance industry, NIC, moved to increase the minimum capital required by insurers to operate in the industry. A move it's justified as part of plans to increase the sector's market offering. Subsequently, companies were given up to June 2021 to meet the new levels. But according to insurance expert Edgar Ruedu, most insurance companies may struggle to meet the deadline as a result of the negative impact the COVID-19 pandemic has had on individuals and businesses. What NIC is trying to do is trying to make sure that um, the insurance companies are strong by way of having solid balance sheets. But the angle that they're taking it from, in my view, is the wrong place. Mr. Redu also raised some concerns about the NIC's approach to handling the capital adequacy matters for insurers. You are asking each one to bring in, all the insurance companies to bring, um, what do you call it, um, 50 million? You're asking the reinsurance companies to make about 125 million, right? I would say, okay, fine. Look, let them maintain their 15 million, but then the 35 million, put it in that deposit. Put it in that deposit at the central bank. Put it together. When you put it together, you will get over 2 billion CDs. And that is five times the capital required for the minimum operating of a bank. The next thing you realize is that you would even become the biggest bank. Some groups like the Ghana Insurance Association and the Insurance Brokers Association of Ghana are currently in talks with the National Insurance Commission for possible extension of the 2021 deadline for meeting the minimum capital requirement. Bismarck Ausa, Joy Business. Free forwarders are asking President Ikufuado to intervene in the chaotic situation at the Tama port. It's been more than a week since implementation of a new port management system, but importers are unable to clear goods. Meanwhile, the Automobile Dealers Union says members will be forced to pass on the cost of delays at the port to consumers. If you look at it critically, it was orchestrated by some people, and those people are there. So if we don't want to even expose their negligence to the general public. The better thing that we can do is just to save the situation for us also to have access for our character as stuck at the harbor. And the price or the cost goes up. Uh, uh, is it the case that are going to pass it to the consumer? Yes, of course, because any person who is selling something, no matter the cost the person is going to incur during the process and put that cost on him, he will definitely pass it on to the consumer. And at the end of the day, the consumer is going to be the sufferer. 
So we want everybody, at least, to involve in this matter. Like I said, those who matter most in this situation should be brought to book. It's an issue. There's no matter that uh, we cannot talk and then resolve them. If only that, the authorities in charge are prepared to solve the issue. They can solve it as easily as something. But it has become something like uh, this man is pulling here, another person is also pulling here, a lot of statements coming from all over. So we don't know the actual uh, issue that is happening now. Meanwhile, member of Parliament's Finance Committee, Isaac Adongo, says Ghana has lost 100 million Ghana cities revenue at the port over a three-day period in April because of mismanagement of the Unipass GCNA transition. He says the loss in revenue has continued to date, causing huge losses to the country. He is therefore calling on government to allow GCNA to continue run operations at the Tema ports. Entries are not going through at KIA. Kodoka International Airport, and the clearers are now being asked to pay a deposit for their cargo and take them home and come back later to rectify. So clearly, we are losing money. In Tama, no single end-to-end -end transaction has gone through since 1st June. They are claiming that it is a transition from West Blue. What it means is that this will continue because since 1st June, vessels are arriving in droves, and we know MPS is now taking bigger vessels. And yet, not a single transaction has gone through since 1st June. So you can imagine 10 days of backlog of shipment. So we are not making money at the port. So our headline story, the constant rise in prices of foodstuff has pushed May inflation rate to 11.3%. The new rate is 1.7% points higher than what was recorded in April 2020. The year-on-year -year inflation rate for May 2020 was 11.3%, 0.7% points higher than last month. Month-on-month -month inflation between April 2020 and May 2020 was 1.7%. This, according to the Ghana Statistical Service, is lower than the 3.2% recorded between March and April 2020. Government statistician Professor Samuel Kwabna Inim has been explaining the the drivers of the new inflation rate. In terms of contribution to year-on-year -year inflation, we see food as a major contributor, and food is contributing about 56 percentage points. Again, he added that this has also been triggered by the increase in food prices before and during the partial lockdown period. Locally produced items continue to dominate imported items by about three times, where locally produced items has an inflationary rate of 14.1% relative to imported items contributing 4.8%. Again, we largely associate these variations of about 3% between imported items and locally produced items to the closure of our borders. That will be all for now. There's more business news when I return after 8 p.m. Thanks so much for watching. Hello, good evening and welcome to the sports part of the news. I am Ureku Ampofo and we started from a former youth and sports minister, Neelant Evanderpoy, who believes the appointment of CK Akuno as head coach of the Black Stars amounts to conflict of interest. Ni, who headed the sports ministry between February 2016 and January 2017, insists CK's choice of players for the senior national team would be under public scrutiny due to a perceived relationship with the, uh, the FA president, Kraku. Now, Joy Sports New Barak Haruna has the rest of the story. CK Akono's appointment, which was officially announced in January this year, raised questions because of his past working relationship with the GFA president at Dreams FC. Few months ago, the GFA president, Keto Kraku, at a meet the press session, said he no longer owned a stake in the sports marketing company, Proton Sports Services, a part of his business many claim managed the former Black Stars captain. No, I don't manage Charles Akono, and I don't manage any coach in Ghana. I've had relationships with lots of people, in the industry. I have known Charles Akono because he also worked at Dreams FC before, just like he's worked in Ashanti Gold, Kotoko, Eleven Wise, etc., etc. Um, so I don't manage Charles Akono and I don't manage any coach in this country. 
despite his comments, former youth and sports minister Neil Ante Van der Poy believes CK should not have been named as the Black Stars coach for fear of conflict of interest. Left me alone, I think Kett should have made that appointment with a sort of thinking that people within football have. People know, uh, people have said that he manages CK Akuno yes. as a person. So it is wrong. It's marks of conflict of interest to have made Siki Akono the coach of the national team. To some extent, I would tend to agree with them, with those people. I have no problem with Kurt uh, deciding who should be the coach. And I have no problem with Siki Akono being the coach in the first place. But for the perception and the whole idea that he's on the books of Kurt as manager, as partner, it's marks of conflict, and that is what people are not happy about. He further called for zero interference on player selection on the part of the FA. Is appointing authority not going to exercise any influence over him? It's one of the questions we've asked. If the GFA president has a management company which is managing the players, some players, and also, man uh, also managing the coach, there is the tendency that, in one way or the other, players who are on the books of that sporting management company or agency will have some undue favoritism, you know, as compared to other players who have nobody. I think the best players should always be called to the national team. The coach will have the right to call the best. Nobody should influence the coach. Akono has been tasked to win the African Cup of Nations next year. Well, that wraps it up for the first part of the sports segment here on Prime. My name is Areko Ampofo. And it's time for Showbiz. Guess what? I have a new face. Kadia Tama, how are you? I'm fine, thank you, Aisha. How are you Great. doing? I'm, do I'm good, 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 good. How, what about... Um, uh, Shata Wali. Okay, so Shata is in the news. He's been trending since morning. And also one of his militants uh, joined 77. He was in an interview with Andy Dusty on the break hit on Hits 103.9 yeah. FM this morning. And um, they called Shata in. And then there was a banter. There was an argument or a misunderstanding. I know, right? You <laughs> yeah. wasn't expecting anything different. Yeah, so, yeah. So <laughs> Shata, you know, there was some misunderstanding. And he got upset. And he was like, okay, I gave you a car. I bought a car for you. Oh, really? I want the car back. All those revelations. And by the time you finish with the interview, <laughs> I'll send people to just come for my car. So by the time the interview was done, people from Shatter's Camp were waiting, waiting oh to take my the car. Goodness. So if you didn't watch that interview, please just watch this. I'll tell you something. Bro, I don't go live for anything. Bro, you see the respect Lady. I get for you. I get, respect for, I get respect for you since. Lady. You know me now, way, I don't go disrespect you, bro. You know the, you know the way me, I love you, and I respect you. So, so, so I don't go. I don't, oh, bro, oh, okay. No problem. You see the car there is? I'm going to make the car collector right now. Oh, bro. Right now. No problem, bro. Right. You see, make you go, make go stop. You don't tell me, you don't love me. Why they do that? Go, 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 you just tell me, say, make I left, make I go. But I don't have mine. I don't have mine, so I will leave you. I don't have, I don't have mine. Listen, I don't have, if I have, if I have mine, so I will leave you, bro. May God punish me. If I have, if I have mine, so I will leave your body. May God punish me. May God not make I go on. If I have no, mind, God, God, God no if I have mind, if I have mind, no so I will leave you like that, bro. The God things no you do for me, the things you do for me, the things you do for me, I appreciate them. Wow. And the things you do for me, God say you appreciate. Come up for there, don't tell me they have to say. bro. Hey, come up for there. Oh, what the, uh, what why, you why, why do you think they make like with this? Like, with the, with hey, what? With I, won't make, I, won't give, I won't give you this opportunity, mm -hmm. but make the whole Ghana, if you leave, if you leave the studio, mm -hmm. go record song today. Mm -hmm. eh? Make you play them. Make mm -hmm. Ghana see say, what are they talk? Are they live? <laughs>
Oh okay, so goodness. that was. <laughs> but if you listen to that interview, the guy was in. It was actually, calm. It yeah, was he like he didn't, he didn't. He didn't even want to leave the camp. Yeah. So, so I don't know why Shatawale was like that. I, and, I and, think and, it was and, something and, personal. And then he came for the car. Yeah. Oh came. my goodness. Yeah. So anyway. okay, on to some other stories. Ah. Uh, um, we had a problem with Mr. Jew and then Ruti Me, mm. Mr. Jew doing a cover of Ruti Me's song and yeah. then it became a whole copyright issue. Mm -hmm. YouTube took down the song. Yeah. Uh, but in case you've not still watched that video, just watch this. Which was uh, pulled down on YouTube and I spoke with that beat god and he is the, the beat maker or the producer responsible for that song and he's saying that he had no idea that Jew was just doing the song to monetize it. He just thought that, oh, it was a cover. So he says more in this interview. <laughs> Wow, so <laughs> this beefing, I guess, will not stop in yeah, the music so industry. <laughs> he's a guy responsible for it, and he had no idea. Of course. Thank you so much for Thank bringing us me. showbiz, and that'll be it for sure. Welcome back to Join News Prime. Now to the rest of our stories. And this story will put a smile on your face like it did to me. As a visually impaired farmer, he has worked for over 30 years, putting food on the table of many families. But all he has to show for his hard work is a weak mud house. Lawrence Demebu, a 60-year-old resident of Afajato South District who vowed never to beg, appealed to kind-hearted people to build him a small, decent retirement house. Guess what? Lions Club, an international humanitarian organization, plans of making his dream come true. Jojo Kovna has the rest of the story. 60-year-old Lawrence Demebu is visually impaired. For many years, he vowed never to beg to survive. With the support of a white cane, he had learned to move independently. He does all domestic chores, including fetching water. Lawrence walks for over 30 minutes, carefully navigating his farm daily to work long hours in order to put food on his table and many other families. However, he does not always reap from his sweat, as unscrupulous people always steal from him. <laughs> Sometimes while harvesting yam, some people follow me and they steal from me. I never find them. They steal my produce in the farm and also at home. For over 30 years, all he has to show for his hard work is a weak madhouse. Although Lawrence had vowed never to beg, he appealed to kind-hearted people to help him build a decent small retirement house. <laughs> Lions Club, a non-political humanitarian organization, vested Lawrence in Liati in the Fajato South District to make his dream come true. Amen. Members of the club presented some items to him. Then Lawrence led them to the proposed site for his dream house. The accommodation, the place of abode is deplorable. The Lions Club delegation, led by Commodore Steve Obimpe, said the team had come for an initial assessment to kickstart the realization of Lawrence's dream. It is your coverage of uh, Lawrence, his uh, accommodation, the farm work, which a friend of uh, a member of us put on our platform, Lions Clubs International, the 3418 Ghana platform, which woke everybody, touched our hearts. So we moved and we thought that because of the particular condition he is in, that is a blindness, which is a component of what we do. I told you Aaron, Lawrence's motto is we serve the underprivileged in our society, especially the blind. And that's what moved us from Accra to come over here. There's a need for a new house, but that will take time. So we have seen the land. Luckily, 
is being granted some land. We we'll need the document before we can work on. Lawrence was excited that his wish would be granted. Uh, okay, according to you, you feel happy that at the long last you also be in a decent uh, accommodation. Uh, at a time where maybe uh, uh, the car is gathering, uh, it doesn't mean it will be over. Okay. George Kobner, Joy News. Now, indeed, residents living in island communities in the Afram Plain say they feel left behind by government's interventions to cushion people as the negative impacts of coronavirus kicks in. Majority of these communities do not have electricity or water, and their farming and fishing livelihoods have taken a hit because of restrictions in movement. Joy News' Justice Bedu has just returned from Lihaji, one of the communities in the Afram Plain South District, to find out how life in a community without power in these times looks like. As night falls in Hlehaji village, Joyce Agbenyega makes dinner as her daughter, who is home because of COVID-19 school closures, goes over her books. Fuel for both is from pricey kerosene. Aside the firewood that goes into this, it leaves them with health costs too. Night fire powered by kerosene produces pollution as bad as smoking 40 pieces of cigarette. The community, like many parts of Ghana, has sunshine in abundance and have a huge potential for solar power. But the cost of acquiring them leaves them without a choice. As we can see at the city or the town, they have electricity, so they watch things, they use internet for learning. But why, uh, because of there is no lights here, we don't have any uh, this thing, education. Communities like Lehaji already have no infrastructure at all. Many of the people here have had their livelihoods badly hit by travel restrictions. And now, though they do not have any case of the virus yet, its impact is felt here like everywhere else. In our area here, if we apply for a teacher to come and teach here, they refuse to come because of electricity. You see, uh, social distance. But, no. okay. uh, but you could see many people come together here to charge their phone. So it's not fine. Kalehaji is not alone. Hundreds of other communities in the country still live without something as basic as electricity. Justice Beidou, Joy News, Kalehaji in the Afram Plains. So some education, Chairman of Vice Chancellor Ghana and VC of the University of Ghana, Professor Benezo Drousu says effective use of online learning systems will now become the new normal during this coronavirus period and its aftermath. Speaking during the launch of the disinfection of all public, private universities and other tertiary institutions in the country, he stated online learning is a solution as some institutions continue to struggle to construct structures to accommodate the over-increasing number of students. Maxwell Agbagba has more in the following report. The Zoom Lion disinfection of all tertiary institutions in the country comes ahead of the return of final year students of the various schools. 
The exercise hopes to provide a safe, COVID-free environment for the students who are returning to school. The Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, Professor Ebenezer Odru, who said online education is now the new normal. Large number of students, um, lack of space for them, and so on and so forth. So if we try this and we realize that it is working, why don't we have a blended approach to make sure that more students can access our programs? So you don't necessarily have to walk into campus all the time to have a face-to-face -face interaction to, to get a degree. We can have that blended approach where we have online, occasionally you can come to campus. In that case, we can increase our intake without having a toll on, on our facilities. Every uh, what is the situation, whether good or bad, presents opportunities for learning. And we have learned a couple of them, that you can execute certain things at very cost-effective levels through online. Education Minister Matthew Poku Prempe indicated that the coronavirus pandemic has necessitated virtual learning, adding universities must begin to use a blended approach in teaching. We do know that this COVID has brought into fervor the need to embrace blended learning because we are getting into a new normal and it is imperative that the universities and all Ghana educational institutions adopt uh, uh, blended learning. So going forward, I do know that the University of Ghana had already taken steps in this direction. He also stated a special team has been formed under the senior minister's office to ensure the safe reopening of schools. The president has set up a special team under the office of the senior minister. Uh, with the Director General of Ghana Health Service, Director General of Ghana Education Service, the Director General of the Military Logistics, the Director General, Deputy Director General of Police Welfare, uh, the Ministry of Information, the Ministry of Local Government, to coordinate in the distribution of logistics and then ensure that schools reopening happen safely. And this spraying will go occur in both public and private institutions. Also, not only, only those under the Ministry of Education, but other institutions outside the ambit of uh, the Ministry of Education. Chief Operating Officer of Zoom Lion, Florence Labby, has been providing details of the mass disinfection exercise of schools. The time slated for this exercise is from the 10th to the 15th. And these are the tertiaries, 240 in number. The second phase will be for the second cycles that number 1,200. And these are all forms of second cycle institutions, including the NVTRs. Mm. They are going to be attended to from the 15th to the 21st. And then the next phase would be the basic schools, that number 25,000. And these are a great number. They are scattered all over the nation. They are going to go to school on the 29th. So their period is from the 21st to the 27th. Persons presumed or known to have COVID-19 in Ghana are still being subjected to stigma despite the many campaigns against it. It turns out frontline health workers in the fight against the pandemic are also being subjected to the same kind of treatment. As we throw the focus on frontline health workers, we bring you the story of Major Mathias, who works at the Elwak Level 2 Isolation and Treatment Center as he speaks of stigmatization against him and his colleagues. Join News as Beryl and Estina Arista tells his story in the following report. Expo Stadium. It was made a treatment center following the outbreak of COVID-19 to complement other isolation treatment centers in the country. Major Mathias Yeli Ahig is the deputy camp commandant here. He's part of a team of over 20 healthcare workers deployed from the Ghana Armed Forces Medical Corps to help manage COVID-19 patients here. Major Yeli Ahig has been in the Ghana Armed Forces Medical Corps for over 10 years. He is a radiographer with the Department of Radiology at the 37 Military Hospital. He knows too well the risks he is exposed to as a frontline health worker in the COVID-19 pandemic fight. But he says he cherishes the opportunity to serve the nation in this historic moment. We took an oath to defend this nation by air, land and sea, even at the peril of our lives. So when the very moment for you to really put that oath to work, 
or to really stand by the words we said before the commander in chief camp. We, we don't hesitate. We rather take pride in that opportunity. What he didn't sign up for, though, is the stigma he says he and his colleague COVID-19 medics have to endure. Major Yeli Ahig says he has had his share. You know, there are times you are with your friends. Even this uh, video that is being aired now, Okay, so Major Yele Ahig. So the next moment you see a friend, you say, ah, Charlie, like last time I see you for TV, yes, sir. So we did a COVID center, I say, yes, sir. Okay, oh boy, please maintain some distance here whilst we talk. <laughs> you know, it's funny, but um, indirectly the person have shown that level of stigmatization we're talking about. As a health professional, he can fairly understand human behavior. What seems to beat his mind lately, though, is why people who have recovered from the disease are also subjected to the same humiliation. Our greatest concern is the patients. Once they live here and they have been declared they've recovered, it means they've recovered. There's no point trying to avoid them or making them, and the worst of it is the non-verbal communications. You know, I can act in such a, in such a certain way that I've not said anything to you. But my body language has communicated a lot to you. We should try and avoid that. Here is what he has to say to those who humiliate persons who have recovered from COVID-19. When they come back, that is when we show them love. We try to learn from their experiences. They will share the stories that they went through so that we know that indeed when we are up against as a nation, it's real. The war against coronavirus rages on all over the world. A daunting one it is. Frontline health workers like Major Yeli Ahik and his colleagues are crucial to this fight. They cannot be stigmatized if they should remain motivated to lead the fight. Beryl and Estina Richter's report for Joy News. The Civil and Local Government Staff Association of Ghana, CLOCSAG, has threatened to go on strike in the next two weeks if SNED fails to come up with an acceptable structure for paying arrears of pensioners of the scheme. Executive Secretary of the Association, Isaac Bampo Ado, revealed its members were currently being paid reduced pensions after years of service instead of the lump sum as stipulated in the Act establishing the National Pensions Regulatory Authority. Nancy M. F. reports from the news conference conveyed by the association that Clocksag is accusing Snate of flouting basic principles of transparency and accountability and also shortchanging pensioners in Ghana. Speaking at a media briefing, Executive Director of Clocksag, Isaac Bampuado, accused the Social Security and National Insurance Trust of making unilateral decisions in paying past credits to retirees without approval from the National Pensions Regulation Commission. We were overwhelmed with incessant calls and contacts from current retirees who have been paid exceptionally low past credits by SNIT on its terms instead of complying with the details of the National Pension Act 208 and directives from the National Pension Regulatory Authority, NPRA. Regrettably, SNIT has not transferred the past credits in its custody to the respective approved trusts who are enjoined by law to manage their Tier 2 funds. Interestingly, SNIT is paying past credits that are part of Tier 2 funds without any approval from NPRA. The non-compliance of this directive from NPRA by SNIT is being looked on without any sanctions. Corroborating his story, President of the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association, Perpetual Oforian Puffo, revealed that the meager amount received by her members is putting untold hardship on them. I've seen these questions over the past four years. We've had various engagements with the Minister of Employment and Labor Relations, with NPRA, with SNIT, with all those other stakeholders. And Smith seems not to budge. Smith seems not to be concerned. And we think that this shortchanging of these retirees is wrong. It is their own money that we are talking about. I had a call from one of our uh, regional constituents, regional executives, and he said one woman received her money from Smith and she collapsed. Yes, that's a nurse, a retiree. She collapsed. And when she regained consciousness and the, it, she tried to reach the union, they now explained to her that, no, it's, it, that is not all. You will take that one from SNIT, and then you come and take the rest also from the health sector occupational pension scheme. 
and that will give you your bulk lump sum. For your monthly um, pension, Senate will continue to pay you your monthly pension. So these are the realities. In the absence of any remedies, the leadership of Clocksack threatened its members across the country will embark on a strike in the next two weeks. The forum objects the actions of SNIT, flouting the principles of transparency and accountability with impunity, leaving our pensioners with very little to go home with. These retirees are being short changed. Within two weeks, if a proper an acceptable basis for payment of part set credits is not arrived at, the forum would have no option than to ask its members to embark on an industrial action. This configure will go and die slowly, past credits can no longer be continued. And we're still live on Joy News Prime. Remember, Joy News is free to air because we are on digital terrestrial TV. We're back shortly with more. Welcome back to business. And let me take you back to the Tama Port because a lot has been happening this week. Just a while ago, the Ghana Institute of Freight Forwarders had a press conference where they are asking government to review the integrated customs management systems, ICOMS, at the country's port. Let's hear from the president of GIF, Edward Akron. The scope of the new normal should be treated with all seriousness because state and private operators within the chain must not benefit undeservedly from a situation which has arisen through no fault of the trader. Anything short of the above will mean the old benchmark will have to be attained by the close of the second week of June 2020 or the status quo before the change be reinstated pending any further form of readjustments. The government will have to carefully appraise this dire situation, and I repeat, dire, because it is dire, and advise itself on the choices to make going forward in this matter. We have had to contend with so many issues with this change. Cost is escalating, because all time-related fees, i.e. demorage, terminal charges, state warehouse rent charges, ground handlers charges at the airport, truck demorage at land frontiers, now all of these have not been held in check as we contend with massive delays and as a result of the change in processes. If this be the new normal, ladies and gentlemen, then the scope of the whole delivery will have to be redefined. Because not too long ago, in 2015, when the pre-arrival assessment reporting system was deployed, it reduced the delivery time of customs classification and valuation report to a publicized 48-hour timeline as per their service level agreement. National Buffer Stock Company says it will commission 50 warehouses in July as part of efforts to shore up storage capacity by government. The 1,000 each capacity warehouses will be used as storage facilities for government businesses. Odilia Ntiamwa spoke with the CEO of the National Buffer Stock Company, Hanan Abdul Wahab. A strategy or a plan for the COVID-19, short term, medium term and long term. So far, we have just executed the, the short-term plan, that is a, a distribution of the dry food to the feed-based organizations. We have been able to do over 500,000 packages for, to the feed-based organization, and the same figure too for the MMDCs uh, in the affected uh, uh, areas. So it's been a very successful uh, program. Uh, we have some stocks of food in our various warehouses across the country that um, are treated and kept there for, you know, uh, when the time is due that we have to, you know, bring it into the system, then we'll introduce it to, to the system. So exactly about how much food has been stored for this program that's in relation to uh, the coronavirus? Okay, so um, what I can say is that we have enough. Uh, we have enough. Uh, it has become a national security issue at this point in time, uh, my dear. 
our weapon is the food that we have and uh, disclosing exact figures of the quantities of food that we have uh, will be unprofessional uh, on us as a food security company because um, um, we are going into a war with an invisible enemy and the only arsenal that we have now is the amount of food that we have. But I can assure you, also as a Ghanaian, that I see that I also have a family across the country that we have enough. And you can be rest assured because it has not affected production. So far, so good. Um, uh, there have been productions in some parts of the country, especially in the south where uh, they are in the peak of their season now. In the north, those who have the opportunity to have um, water bodies around their farms are doing irrigation farming. Uh, for example, the one village, one dam, the ones that are completed, farmers in that catchment area are taking advantage of that and they are doing their all year round or irrigation uh, farming. In the next month or so, farming will also begin or commence in the north. So there's going to be, uh, you know, increase in production, um, farm input, fertilizers and seeds have all moved from. Uh, from the production centers to the farmers. Uh, and then also, uh, plants are also far advanced in the coming days for us to do a formal handing over of the warehouses that are ready. You know, the special initiative has built, have awarded 50 number warehouses of 1,000 metric tons capacity. So out of that, 32 number is ready. And the Ministry for Food and Agriculture have also awarded 30 of 1,000 metric tons capacity, and out of that 14 number is also ready. So we are going to have 14 plus 32 that are ready, that can be used immediately. In more news tonight, experts are warning the National Communications Authority to tread cautiously on MTN's significant market power. Stay tuned for more in the business news summaries. And crude oil sold for $40.93 a barrel, while gold went for $1,717.42 an ounce. The market's performance is up next in the Commodity News. For business tonight, my name is Sandra Essenam Afeno. You can get more news on our website, myjoonline.com forward slash business. Stay home, stay safe, and stay beautiful. And thanks so much for watching. The scene of crime where they engage an armed robbery gang. Police say this could lead to the escape of some suspects. Two members of a six armed robbery were gunned down by police at Santase, a suburb of Kumase, after they engaged police in an exchange of gunfire. Police were following up on intelligence that the group were planning an attack on some residents there. Police accosted them, resulting in a shootout. My colleague Ohim Interior has more. Police say the group is involved in car snatching and robbery, including the recent one in Mansuda Diaz, where a gold dealer was targeted, leading to the killing of three people, including the driver of the district chief executive for Amancia South. DCOP David Ajem is a deputy Ashanti Regional Police Commander. Based on intelligence, last night um, we sent some of our men to um, a site where we believed um, some members of an armed robbery group were gathering to go and operate. Um, when they saw the officers approaching, um, they shot at them, injuring one officer in the process. And so the officers needed to return fire. In the course of the shooting, um, two of the robbers were hit and they died. The others uh, escaped. And so we'll take this opportunity to um, inform all health facilities and herbal centers that if they get any persons who have gunshot wounds, they should immediately inform us so that we can arrest these persons for questioning. These um, hoodlums were believed, based on our intelligence, were the persons who had earlier 
in the month or last late last month uh, carried out an operation at um, Manso Dadieso where three persons were killed. In According to DCOP David Ajeman Ajem, the presence of residents who came out of their homes to witness the shootout towards the police air force to arrest all the armed robbers. It did um, greatly affect us because, uh, but for that, we would have been able to arrest the ones who were fleeing. But because there were too many persons there, um, we could not do what was expected of us. And I'll take this opportunity to advise the general public. If you hear gunshots, please stay where you are take cover rather than come out. And we are lucky that none of them was injured in the shootout. And so once you hear gunshots, stay put, take cover, and then um, wait till um, things subside because you could be caught in crossfire. The police officer who was injured in the shootout is responding to treatment at a health facility. Meanwhile, the bodies of the two suspects who were killed in the shootout have been deposited at the Confarnochi Teaching Hospital's morgue pending autopsy. The robbers were in the Black BMW 5 Series with registration number GR761512. And an on the spot search on the vehicle revealed an SMG rifle loaded with seven rounds of ammunition and one 9mm uh, 6R uh, SP22. 22 pistol, also loaded with 11 rounds of ammunition. Uh, we found a phone as well. The dead persons were sent to the Confanoche Teaching Hospital mortuary, where later we'll do an identification and post-mortem of the persons. From Kumasi, for Joy News, Wahim Interia reporting. And back here in Accra and in the studio, my name is Aisha Ibrahim, and we'll take a break on Joy News Prime. When we return, Ore Kwampofo comes your way with sports. <laughs> And welcome to the second part of the sports segment with me, Eric Wampofo. Interallies FC CEO Eric Delali Senaye has said that football club's contribution in the economic development in Ghana is undermined and underrated. Now, Mr. Senaye believes that that's why government is reluctant in supporting the clubs financially during this period of the coronavirus crisis. Government is giving stimulus packages to several industries in the country that have been hit financially by the global pandemic. The Ghana FA sent a proposal to the government requesting for financial support, but many believe that there are more pressing issues than football. Mr. Senaye claims there has been no research on the importance of football in Ghana's economic growth, thus making it difficult for people to believe otherwise. According to him, the football industry is undervalued. Every match that uh, clubs are involved in, by way of gate fee, we pay 17.5% of that. We also, those who are limited by by shares, end of, end of, his, end of the year, they, if profit is declared, they pay corporate tax. We pay all that taxes. We, we drive football, drive the local tourism uh, economy. If Interallies travel to Brekum, it means that we are going to occupy one hotel there, 15 rooms in total. We are going to sleep there two days. We spend money there. On the March day, the folks in Brekum also involved in other activities, selling water and the rest. Football contributes hugely on the local economy through tourism. But our industry is underrated. Our industry is not known. There has been no scientific research to know the imp economic importance of football in our economy. 
With a pandemic causing distress in nearly every single sector, Mr. Delaye Senaya has advised that clubs must take the initiative of seeking for insurance cover to protect clubs in case of future pandemics. I'm very much of the view that after this crisis, clubs should take steps to take insurance cover against unforeseen like this, so that if it does happen again, we can fall on such protection. I think the way to go is to ensure against future occurrence of, of uh, situations like this, unforeseen situations like this. I think it will help, help all of us and also give us some security. The Minister of Youth and Sports recently at a press briefing announced that football industry would in one way or the other be covered with a stimulus package described as youth in elite sport. That wraps it up for the sports segment with me, Oriel Kowampo, for do remember to stay safe. And it's time now for the interactive segment. And you've been hearing what the former president, John Mahama, has been talking about. He says the NDC will not accept results of any flawed elections. We posted this a while ago on our Facebook page. It's generated lots of comments over there. Um, it, uh, let's see, 56 comments there. And Gideon Azubila says... Even a coup for Ado, the president now never knew and never won the election fair and square. It's most unfortunate. He said, um, please, let's be decorum with our words. And we see a champion says, NDC's 28th birthday. But where, where was the founder of the NDC party on this great occasion? Oh, NDC, thanks for all the and the center hole. Felicia, um, and, and of course, let's, let's try not to be harsh. Let's be decorous with our words. Felicia Awa says, what if you win? Will you accept the results? I don't like the EC either. I'm a traditional queen sister. And if you disrespect our traditional rulers, you disrespect us too. Wake up, wake up, Mama Africa leaders. Kingsley AJ says, this man will regret if he dares misbehave during and after the election. And Balfour says, the EC hasn't done anything wrong. You have been preparing the minds of your supporters for impending uh, upcoming elections since 2016. At every turn, you've winked and moaned like an infant. Do you understand? Um, and of course, again, let me remind us that we shouldn't be harsh in our messaging. Otherwise, we would omit those messages. We will not read them. Mm -hmm. Richard says, the problem NDC is having is unpopular Mahama as their flag bearer. They knew he cannot win them and the election, so they resort to blame games ahead of the elections. Ms. Bao Bao says, this word of the former president is more dangerous than all die be die. And Moro Zakaria says, we the youth are going to die because of you people. If you observe that you politicians are going to cause chaos, we will not come out to vote. Kwame Champion says, you think Ghana youth will follow your words and do things like previous years, eh? And you do not being said, why is he missing some pages? So incompetent, he should get ready to go to court. Andrew Sarnoche says, another four more years for Nanado. And Harrison Bunso says, what you can do is to go to court. Apart from that, you can't do anything. Me boy Clotty says, preparing to lose election 2020, finding excuses for election 2020 laws. And Emmanuel Christie says, desperate for power. Honorable Stephen James Fee says, power and desperation trusted days ahead. Interesting things, I guess that's what you want to say. And Alex Afari says, Mr. X, please, our mothers and wives are in there. Mind your talk. And that will be it for the interactive segment. Well, before we end, though, uh, we also posted this EC's voters registration controversy. This is not the right time to compile a new voters register. And this is coming from Domahini Osaji for Sadio Ajiman Bidu the second. We also posted this a while ago. And guess what? 319 comments, 138 shares. Oh, Manuel Fusu says, lose talk from the chief. Tell Ghanaians that because of the COVID-19, they shouldn't be election this year. How about those who have attained 18 years? Do we have to register them or we shouldn't register them because we are in COVID-19 period? And Nana Kwabinan Ketia says, no one in his rights, um, no one, uh, please, let's be, uh, let's not be harsh. 
and Andy Abua says, then tell NDC that because of COVID-19, we shouldn't vote. If we can go and vote while coronavirus is there, then why can't we do new voters' ID? We need new register. A simple and easy must do their work without any interference like NDC is doing. Newman Collins says, this is the kind of leaders every community needs. Thank you, Nana, for this necessary advice. Akufuad was begging Ghanaians for votes in 2016, but now he feels Ghana is his property. Every wise Ghanaian knows this chief is speaking the truth. Nani Kwame says, everyone knows dude is and has always been NDC. Solomon Ose says, I hope if another chief should come and support the idea of EC2, I hope we won't talk. If because of COVID-19 is not needed to do new register, then why do we vote because COVID-19 is still there? Hmm, Ghana. And those are some of your comments on that as well and that'll be it for the interactive segment that also wraps up the bulletin tonight many thanks for watching my name is Aisha Ibrahim PM Express is up next very interesting conversation about public safety and security please stay tuned <laughs>